Uh, good day to everyone and thank you so much uh, to the um, NST program of the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs of UP Diliman. I'm Attorney Francis Tom Tembrosa. I'm the Director for Human Rights Education and Promotion at the Commission on Human Rights. And thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss um, human rights and the NSTP uh, before the students today. It really gives me a great pleasure to discuss to you um, a few things about human rights and human dignity and also relate the concept of human rights to the NSTP program of UP Diliman. Uh, in case you might be wondering, uh, the human rights uh, as a concept uh, is very much related to the National Service Training Program. Um, I myself, uh, I'm a graduate of UP Diliman. Um, and let me just share to you a brief uh, anecdote about myself or any, oh, it's, it's a story that, relate, that relates to uh, human rights and my formation as a student in UP Diliman. Uh, when I was in UP Diliman, like probably most of you, uh, I started out uh, my education in college uh, without knowing much about our country and our society. In UP Diliman, I was exposed to the different issues, uh, challenges and problems that our country faces. Um, and in, in, in my time in UP Diliman, I've come to know that human rights are indeed fundamental to, to the shaping and formation of our country. Um, my education in human rights did not stop there. When I went to the law school and I studied law, uh, I was also exposed to the different problems of our country, although in a legal sense. And the different problems that we have in our country, especially the legal problems, also very much relate to the situation of human rights. Uh, and uh, I was first exposed actually to the concept of human rights when I was taking up law. Uh, because human rights as a concept is very much ingrained in the Constitution of the Philippines, we see this in the Bill of Rights. We also see this in the different laws that our country um, has for human rights, for the protection and promotion of human rights. And I took an elective on human rights law, uh, which actually exposed me to the different facets of human rights. Um, I also very much uh, involved myself in works with refugees, the stateless and the internally displaced in our country working also after graduating uh, for the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And then after that, I took on uh, jobs in government. Uh, and then uh, uh, after taking postgraduate studies in the United States, I went on to work for the Human Rights Commission. As much as we don't know it, but human rights are very much present in our daily lives. From the moment we wake up uh, to, the, to the time when we go to bed, uh, we are exposed to different issues in everyday life that involve human rights. So let me tell you now, what are human rights? Human rights are the basic freedoms and the protection that belong, that should belong to each one of us. No? Um, each one of us as a human being have what we call fundamental human rights. Why do I say these are fundamental? These are fundamental because these rights are our entitlements. These rights belong to us, no matter what our status in life is, what our gender is, what our socioeconomic class is, um, where we belong, what group or organization, our level of educational attainment, and many other things. They all belong to us because we are human, because they are rights. What do we mean by rights? Rights are basically entitlements. It means that they already belong to you. They are part of your being the moment you were born. No? Uh, rights are entitlements. That means that rights belong to you from the moment you were born. They are not given to you. They actually belong to you. They are ingrained in your human personality, in your human being. No? So, human rights are rights that belong to human beings by being human beings. They belong to you. Now, there are many explanations as to what human rights, uh, the sources 
of human rights are. No? Some say that human rights are given by the God that we believe in. No? They are created and imposed. Uh, they are also inherent in our human being. But what we believe is that human rights are inherent in our human being. Human rights are there because we are humans. Uh, now, the concept might seem to be a bit abstract and nebulous. It might seem to be far-fetched. But when you think about it, when you think about rights as entitlements, it now becomes clear to you. What do you actually need as a human being to live? That's what human rights are. Your needs become rights. They become entitlements. They are rights. They are entitlements. For example, you have the right to food because without food, it's just impossible for you to live. You have the right to water because you need water to live. In that sense, rights become clearer. And rights become part of our everyday life if we think about them in that sense. But we have to move beyond, above and beyond what we call the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. We also need to think of what we call your civil and political rights. Civil and political rights are rights that belong to you because you are part of a collective. You are part of society. For example, you have the freedom of expression. That is a right. You deserve and you actually have the right to speak out on matters that are important to you. You have the right to tell what you think. You have the freedom to believe. And because you are also part of society, you have the right to vote. You have the right to politically participate in society. So that's civil and political rights. On the other hand, and I have said earlier, you have what we call the rights to economic, social, and cultural. You have rights that are economic, social, and cultural. These rights are rights that you need as a human being to survive and in addition to that, to thrive in your society, in your own culture. That's why they're called economic, social, and cultural rights. These are rights that belong to you, not because you're part of, a, of society, but they belong to you because you're a human being and you need them to thrive and survive. For example, you have the right to food. That is an economic, social, and cultural right. You have the right to housing. You have the right to adequate standard of living because you need that. You need certain minimum standards and guarantees. There are certain minimum standards and guarantees for you to live. And also, you have the right to work. You have the right to education. And you have the right to your own culture. So those are, in a nutshell, what human rights are. Again, human rights are entitlements that belong to you because you are a human person. They already are yours the moment you were born. You might be asking me, oh, but this sounds a bit still unclear to me. Actually, the human rights that I'm talking about are already enshrined in laws that the states all over the world guarantee and realize to be very fundamental. That's why they came up with a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you will see the different rights that every human being um, you know, has. And in the Philippines, the human rights, the concept of human rights, is in the Constitution, the very fundamental law of our country. So if you need to, to be clarified about what your rights are, you need to only look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there, mind you, there are also other treaties, treaties or agreements about human rights that you can look, look at. And also, you can also look at our very own constitution and the different laws so that you, then you will realize that rights are very much present in your everyday life. So having talked about that, now let's go to what are the different principles about human rights. There are many principles 
of human rights. And I'm only presenting to you a handful of them. The first one is universality. Universality tells us that human rights belong to all of us. They belong to everyone. And in that sense, they are universal. They're not dependent on culture. Why do I say that? Because rights belong to us the moment we were born. And all of us here exist and we, are, we have been born. So that means all of us have rights. Rights are then universal because they belong to all of us. The second that I want to talk about is inalienability. As I said earlier, rights are rooted in your dignity as a human being. And in that sense, because they are rooted in your dignity and they belong to you as a human person, they cannot be taken away from you. In that sense, rights are inalienable because they cannot be taken away from you. The third one is indivisibility and interdependence. Now, what is that? When we think about it, human rights as a concept is one integrated whole. Although there are many different rights, yes, I mentioned some of the different rights that you and I have. That means, however, that human rights as a concept is only one integrated whole. The concept is indivisible. What do I mean by indivisible? You cannot actually pick and choose, and you should not pick and choose which rights should be provided to you, because anyway, they belong to you. But not only that, the government should not pick and choose which rights are to be respected, protected, and fulfilled. Because the protection of one right or the non-protection of one right actually, actually affects another. I'll give you a very concrete example. If you are deprived of the right to food, your right to life might also be affected. If you're not given the right to food, you're not accorded rather, or your right to food is not respected, your right to life might be affected. Okay? Because you might not live. It might affect your right to life. Okay? The other principle that I want to speak about is non-discrimination. From the premise that rights belong to all of us, they are universal. They cannot be taken away from us. They're also indivisible. They're also interdependent to each other. What flows from that is that, what's, what flows from those is that, you know, um, human rights are to be given to all. Or human rather, human rights of all should be protected, respected, and fulfilled. There should not be discrimination. The rights of all, not the rights of only the few. So, freedom of speech, for example, should be accorded to all. There should not be any discrimination. Whatever your gender is, whatever your status is, whatever your social class is, for example. Now, I also want to say that a lot of people think of human rights as my right. But we also have to think about responsibilities. For the exercise of human rights come with responsibilities. And also, we have to remember that the rights that we have are rights of human beings. And therefore, the one that has the primary responsibility to respect protect and fulfill rights are actually is actually the government. The government is the one which is responsible to ensure that human rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled because they are rights of human beings, human beings that are that are uh, possessed with the rights. Now, what is the other reason for that? The simple and pragmatic explanation for that is that Human rights commitments are commitments undertaken by the government. Okay, so what does it all have to do with community engagements and the NSTP? 
we should have a human rights based approach that involves a consideration of both what you are going to do and how you are going to do it. Now, we realize that human rights are the rights of people, of human beings. With every step that we take, we should always have human rights in mind because every step that we take involves people. The, the actions, the programs, the policies that we have involve people. So in the decisions, the actions, and priorities that we have, they should all be approached with a, an eye or an analysis as to uh, the human rights aspects of things. In the community, we realize that human rights or approaching things through a lens of human rights is important because this provides a way to have good practices of how we can have approaches to the community, uh, the way we do things with the community, for example, that have an eye for the human being. Because in communities, there are human beings as well. So for example, the agenda that we have should have an eye for the people that we are serving. There should also be equal opportunity for everyone. And the agenda that we have should assess the impact that we have on people, that they have on people. In other words, we should view people as human beings rather than just objects of charity or rather than just contributors to the economy. The implication of this, of course, there are many implications, but I just want to highlight um, there a few. The first one is participation. It means that when we're doing an STP work, which is heavy on community engagement, we should always, always keep in mind that the people that we're working with should be able to contribute to our work. We should be able to ask them what they think. We should ask them about their feelings about the project. And we should take them as you know, partners in what we do. They are not mere objects of charity. And also, it involves more than just consultation. Time and resources will often be needed to create the capacity for participation. When you think of participation, participation is a continuum. Participation is a continuum. It's from information, consultation, partnership, delegation, and control. This simply means that we not only inform them of what we are doing in the community, but we also give them some level of control so that they will become part of whatever we are doing, whatever projects we are embarking on in the NSDP. For example, when we have social, social and economic literacy projects with the community, we should be able to ask them what they think about those projects. We should be able to consider what their needs are. And we should be able to pay attention to those and give them some level of control in deciding if they really want to pursue those projects with us. In the participation continuum, there are also different human rights concepts that are related. The first is accountability. As I said earlier, earlier, all human rights carry corresponding duties and therefore we should also be accountable in the projects that we have with them. Number two is that we should have and observe rather the principle of non-discrimination, equality, and attention to vulnerable groups. A very important principle in human rights is non-discrimination. I have talked about this. In non-discrimination, you also pay attention to those who are left behind. In identifying the projects, the programs, we should also take into consideration who the vulnerable groups are in the certain situation or in the project that we will embark in. For example, are there women involved in the project? Are there children involved in the project? Are there fisher folks? Are there indigenous persons? Are there persons with disabilities? Are there older persons? How are we taking into consideration their different needs? Remember that rights are also rooted on the needs of people, which then translate to entitlement. The other one, number three, is empowerment. Our goal in human rights is to have 
and to be able to empower people. Ultimately, the projects that we should have are geared towards empowering them, empowering communities. Because as I said earlier, they should have a stake in whatever we do. And the fourth is that we should link to human rights standards. So I think a fundamental principle that's also related to this is doing no harm. In whatever project that we're embarking in, we should have we should not create, produce, and contribute to more harm. Right? We should also progressively try to realize, despite the limited resources, all right, the different economic, social, and cultural rights that people have. We should we could contribute to all of those, to all of those. Now, I know that the NSPT program has three components, the ROTC, the LTS, and the CWTS. How does a human rights-based approach look like when we try to employ this in the NSTP? I'll give you some examples. As I said earlier, human rights really involve looking at what are the rights of the people in a given situation. Who are the people and what should we do about that? Okay. ROTC is very much about military training. But actually, from a human rights-based approach, we should think of the link between security and human rights. Because security is a human right. People have the right to be secure in their own persons and in society. When you think about it, ROTC is also about peacemaking and peace building. It is also about respecting the rights of people in the security sector. So, the question that we can probably reflect on is, are our projects actually promoting security? Are our projects contributing to making peace? Or are they instead disrupting the peace? The second one is the LTS. Now, Literacy is at the heart of basic education, which is, again, a human right. Creating literate environments and societies is essential in order to achieve the goals that we have in society, in order for us to develop, in order to sustain development, etc. So, it is evident that the right to education is at the core of literacy. So, it is not only a tool but it is also a right you know, that helps achieve the fulfillment of the goals of people, the development of the human person. Therefore, we should always have an eye for education whenever we are doing literacy or LTS work. Probably some questions to ask ourselves for reflection are, if I have contributing to education. Another one is, is the education that I'm providing, is the service that I'm providing, Helping people develop, because that's really the goal, to develop people. And oh, since I'm right, probably one of the things that you can do are teaching people about their rights. Because part of education is also teaching people about their rights. When people know their rights, they become better uh, partners. They also become better members of society. Now, the last one is CWTS. I know that CWTS is very much involved in community empowerment. And community empowerment is about working in ways to empower people so that they do not only feel confident, but they are also involved and they're also organized and they influence the different processes in service, in community. It is about enabling communities to increase control over their lives. Now, there are different rights and there are different people in society and in communities. So there are different questions now that we can ask ourselves. In the community uh, CWTS training service that we provide, are we looking at the different stakeholders or different people involved in the community? Are we responding to their needs and therefore their rights? Are we giving them their stake? Or is our um, program merely dole out, merely charity? Because as I said earlier, 
CWTS is about empowerment. At the end of the project, we should be able to make we should be able to contribute, if not make sure that people are there and that they realize that they are empowered. So, um, in the NSTP, we don't realize it, but a lot of the programs that we could and that we currently have, many of them involve human rights. The first one is a suggestion. Probably, NSTP programs could partner with human rights organizations for students to be exposed to the different human rights issues and challenges that we face in society today. NSTP projects could also partner with different government institutions that work on human rights issues, such as the CHR. And in the partnership, I urge you to also consider talking directly to human rights advocates, human rights defenders, and not only that, human rights violations victims, so that people will also be involved in their plight or have a stake in their plight and be inspired or be moved by the different challenges that they face. The other one, number two, is about education. I actually urge and employ you to also think of projects that teach people directly about their rights. No? What happens, for example, if someone gets arrested? What are their rights? You can teach that. What happens when someone gets invited to the pursuit of the police, by the police? What are their rights? What are the rights of people in education? What are the rights of the youth? What are the rights of women? What are the rights of children? What are the rights of the PWDs? Now, the third thing that can be done is about advocacy. Advocacy has a lot of meaning, but it is true that advocacy means encouraging human rights behaviors and promoting rights. Now, in this regard, we can have projects that actually encourage government and other people to uphold human rights. What do I mean by that? For example, people can write to their legislators to uphold human rights, to come up with legislation that actually respond to different human rights issues that we face today. That can be around different laws that can promote and protect the rights of women, the rights of the LGBTQ people, and many, many other things. You can probably write to legislators, have position papers, and have events that encourage people to protect human rights, especially those in government. Number four, there can also be projects that help protect human rights. What do I mean by that? There can be a project that could actually collect incidents, for example, of violence against women in communities. There can be projects that talk to people, for example, children that face uh, children who face abuses. And we can document and certainly come up with data on those. Fifth, and this is also possible, about preventing human rights abuses. One place where we see um, that is crucial to the protection and prevention of human rights violations is the detention centers. There can be projects developed around looking into the situation of, of people who are detained, people who are what we call persons deprived of liberty. We can visit their, their places and look into their human rights situations. The sixth project, and really I encourage you, is to just broadly partner with activities that may relate to human rights one way or the other. This can be through legal caravans and even in bloodletting activities that help realize people's rights. Legal caravans promote access to justice, which is a human right. And also, uh, the bloodletting activities promote and help us in pursuing the right to health of everyone. But there should be a realization that human rights are very much pressed in all of them. So that's it.
I hope you have learned something today. Um, we at the Human Rights Education and Promotion Office of the CHR are very happy to partner with you if you have any sticky projects. And we can do uh, these projects together. And we can, of course, partner with, with them, uh, with communities rather, with a human rights-based approach to all of the NSTP activities. Our doors are open to you. Our hotlines are being now, are now being flashed on your screen. And please do visit us uh, in the, in the web, through the website of the CHR, through the Facebook account of the CHR. The CHR is also present in TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. We also encourage you, especially for my office, to all the educators out there, to visit Human Rights Institute CHR. That is the Facebook page of the Human Rights Institute of the Commission on Human Rights. We also have what we call the Online Human Rights Academy, where you can take courses for free on human rights. Just visit humanrightsinstitute.ph. Again, maraming maraming salamat po at lagi po nating tandaan, lamang po ang may alam sa human rights. And human rights po are very important in our lives because it is the dignity of all. Again, thank you very much po and have a good day.